Thank you very much. Can you all hear me and see my screen OK? I think we all can. Wonderful. So uh, first of all, thank you so much to uh, Estelle and Vijay for uh, inviting me and putting together this uh, seminar series. Uh, I join Hauser uh, Helmet in uh, thanking you both for this. I I'm excited. I want to attend. Um, my apologies that I can only attend today uh, remotely. It's uh, a beautiful fall uh, morning here uh, in Vermont, uh, here in the northeast of the U.S. So um, uh, Helmut ended by asking the question, you know, what is a robot? And uh, I would argue that what you're seeing here is a robot. Uh, these are the Xenobots, which I will uh, talk about shortly. Um, but before I do, I wanted just to take a, a few steps back and, and like Helmet, talk a little bit about the spirit of um, academic work in morphological computation. Um, Helmut and I are academic brothers, so I, I feel like I'm among family here and I'm very much uh, happy to be here. I will uh, only speak briefly and then open up the floor for questions and ideas that we can all share. Um, uh, Helmut and I are, are academic brothers. Uh, we both uh, share an advisor, uh, Rolf Pfeiffer, who's now retired. Um, when I was a PhD student with uh, working with Rolf, I would ask him, you know, for advice about how to do science, how to write a paper, you know, how to find a postdoc, and he would notoriously resist giving advice. He said, uh, that's not what us gray hairs are supposed to do. We're not supposed to give advice. I said, but Rolf, you're, you're my advisor. You're supposed to advise me. And he resisted and resisted and became a running joke between Rolf and I. Eventually, eventually he said, all right, I'll give you one piece of advice, which is don't take anyone's advice, which I thought was great advice. Um, but I'm going to break Rolf's rule and, and offer a little bit of advice to you all, especially those of you that are starting out uh, in academia, the doctoral students that are here. Um, Part of the fun in being in academia is trying out some crazy ideas. As uh, Helmut mentioned, we work in sort of a niche area of robotics and AI, this idea of morphological computation. It's not very w widely known. A lot of the robots and the machines and the ideas we work with look very familiar or alien to some of our robotics and AI colleagues. Um, but I think it's important, important that we try. This is the history of academia. Uh, seemingly crazy ideas often uh, end up panning out. So I, I would uh, encourage you to be courageous in your choice of research questions. Just because you're not working in the mainstream of AI and robotics, that's, uh, that's possibly a good thing. Um, we are, of course, seemingly in the middle of an AI uh, high summer. It seems like every week or almost every day, there's some breathtaking advance in non-embodied uh, AI, sometimes in robotics, but mostly non-embodied uh, AI. Um, in my own career, I, I think I've been very fortunate. Um, I've had, I don't know about successful projects, but at least some that seem to uh, be of interest to our colleagues or the general public. This is sort of a, a smattering of research projects that I've been involved in uh, over the years. Um, the basic approach uh, in, my, uh, in my now group is to use evolutionary search processes to search the space of all possible robot body plans and control policies to look for good body policy pairs. Uh, as Helmut just mentioned, we have to think about the body, not just the control policy, if we're interested in uh, adaptive or intelligent behavior. And we particularly have to pay attention to the body when we're trying to instantiate or embody those intelligent behaviors in exotic machines. So uh, starting out my career, I did a lot of work with uh, traditional robots, rigid robots, kinematic chains, maybe not that, that interesting. Um, I've moved on since then into the soft robotics space, like many of you uh, at, at Bristol. Um, you can see a few examples in the middle, middle right and lower left panels here. And most recently, uh, we've started to dabble with a particularly interesting uh, robot platform, which is building robots only from biological materials. These are the uh, biobots or computer designed organisms, or as they're now known in popular culture, the xenobots. And you see some of those bottom center. Most recently, uh, we've been doing work with granular metamaterials, which you see on the bottom right. Um, I know, again, a lot of you are interested in the material science side of morphological computation. So I'll try and say something about that uh, before I wrap up. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few projects, but I think that the main message I'd like to get across today is this idea of morphological computation is really in the spirit of trying to think broadly about how we go about creating intelligent machines. As 
uh, Helmut said, we need to think outside the box, but I'll invite you to think inside the box uh, for a moment. Um, there's an, a, a conceptual idea in evolutionary biology, which is the concept of uh, morphospace, the space of all possible organisms. Organisms that do exist, have existed in the past, or could possibly exist. This is a, a near infinite high dimensional space, and you can think of biological evolution as moving through this space and discovering particular uh, organisms that are able to survive and reproduce here on Earth. We can port that idea of morphospace to robotics and somewhat tongue in cheek refer to this as robospace. We can come up with lots of different uh, ways of defining this space. Um, in the three dimensional example I have here, we can think about robots in this space as being more or less competent further to the right in this cube. They may be more general purpose. They may be able to perform more tasks, meaning they exist higher up in this cube, or they may be more embodied. They, more, they may exist towards the back of this cube. Um, in my own group, whenever we tackle a new, um, a new robot platform like soft robots or biological robots, we try and think about what does the robo space look like for that particular substrate? We try and create evolutionary algorithms that are able to search the space. And we try and create fitness functions that push the search process into non-intuitive corners of the space. What do I mean by that? Um, for a lot of these platforms, there seems to be an intuition for what's going to work. If we're gonna work with rigid uh, parts, why don't we build a humanoid body and then try and uh, program or train a control policy for it uh, or a dog-shaped robot? Soft robots, same thing. Let's make a four-legged robot and see what we can do. But again, that's human intuition. What else exists in these spaces? Can evolution, in this case, artificial or computational evolution, find non-intuitive combinations of body and brain that shed light on the ways in which intelligent behavior can arise in machines and possibly in organisms? And then it also gives us new ideas about morphological computation. What does it mean for the body to participate in intelligent behavior? So I'll just show you very quickly, sort of taking a path through this space. I'm just gonna mute this video, it's quite loud, if I can. Uh, in, uh, when I worked with Hod Lipson at Cornell University, we worked on rigid robots and we looked at a particular aspect of intelligence, which is resiliency. What happens when the robot's body changes? In this case, what happens when the robot's body changes unintentionally as a result of injury or damage or wear and tear? Um, if you're a rigid robot, there's only so many options you have available to you, um, and they all fall into sort of one category of recovery strategies which is to update the brain, update the control policy. That's it, that's all you have available to you. If we take that same, uh, that same challenge, recovering from unexpected damage and explore this with soft robots, the nature of soft materials provides uh, the animal or the machine in this case, other options, which is to adapt the body and or the control policy in response to damage. Here's an example of a four-legged uh, robot. We've evolved a control policy for this robot so that it can move. And then in a moment, we're going to uh, visit a particularly grievous injury on this robot. We're gonna cut off all four of its legs. This robot could adapt its control policy. It could adapt its body. In this case, it chooses to adapt its body. The control policy that is running this robot is exactly the same control policy as it was using pre-injury. It's basically just quote unquote, grown or recovered an approximation of its original uh, body plan. I, I don't have time to get into this particular project at the moment, but one of the interesting things we found in this project is that often uh, there were a lot of non-intuitive solutions in this space. In a lot of cases where we cut off one or a few of the soft robots uh, legs or body parts, it wouldn't necessarily evolve the ability to regrow that lost structure. It might, for example, retract the remaining legs and move in a peristaltic motion or it might flip on its back and sort of throw its body weight forward. There were a lot of different solutions, a lot of non-intuitive solutions in this space. 
that again led us to new ways of thinking about morphological computation. How can you exploit your body when your body is being changed by the environment through injury and damage? So we've looked at injury and damage uh, in rigid robots. We've looked at this in soft robots. And I'm going to move on very quickly now to looking at the same ability to adapt, but in biological robots. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the origin story of our work on uh, biological robots. Um, we teamed up uh, three years ago now with two biologists, uh, Michael Levin and Doug Blackiston at Tufts University. Um, Mike and Doug have done some amazing work over the years. Uh, I'll just pick one example that I found particularly inspiring. Back in 2013, uh, they genetically modified uh, DNA uh, in a, a frog egg so that the frog would grow, uh, would, would not grow eyes. So it's gene a genetically modified blinded frog. You can see in the left of this image, it has no eyes. Uh, as it was developing from blastula, very early frog embryo uh, into tadpole, uh, Doug came, came in and explanted or, or rearranged some frog tissue to place eye precursor cells, embedded them into the tail of the tadpole that you can see here. Not only did this relatively severe uh, surgical intervention not kill uh, the animal, um, didn't seem to bother the animal at all. Uh, as this particular frog was growing from tadpole to frog, these eye precursor cells self-organized and started to grow an adult frog, uh, an adult frog eye. That eye sent out uh, uh, neurons and synapses and was able to connect with the spinal cord uh, of the developing frog. And this tadpole grew into a perfectly healthy uh, adult frog with an eye on its butt. You got to love academia where you can get away with these kinds of things. And if you placed uh, a dead a dead fly somewhere near the frog, the frog would turn and uh, spit out its tongue and capture this fly on its first attempt, which means the frog can see perfectly fine out of this uh, eye on its butt. A lot of implications of this work. Um, one of the one of the ideas we threw around when they when we started working with Mike and Doug with, was in this case there's a human that's deciding how and where to rearrange frog tissues. Could we turn this tissue rearrangement task over to an art to an AI or a machine learning method, and could it come up with rearrangements that lead to some new stable phenotype that is different from the default phenotype, which is an adult healthy frog? The answer turned out to be yes. Took a little bit of work to get this to, to work. Um, I'll just tell you about the first experiment we did in this space. Uh, at the, uh, back in 2019, um, Doug Blackiston, the microsurgeon uh, on this team, told us that he could surgically extract two types of cells from early frog blastula, frog skin cells, which like, like our skin cells are passive, uh, passive and soft. They can be pulled and pushed by neighboring tissues. Uh, Doug was also able to surgically extract myocardiac tissue, so tissue that basically increases and decreases in volume. Uh, myocardiac tissue during normal development, it forms up into a frog heart. Uh, those patches of tissue communicate with one another and somehow figure out how to synchronize uh, their beating so that the heart uh, acts as a pump. So those were the two building blocks uh, that Doug made available to us. So we created a relatively simple uh, evolutionary algorithm. And what you're looking at here is three of the initial random guesses that the evolutionary algorithm made. It's trying out different combinations of simulated frog skin and simulated frog myocardiac tissue in silico in the simulation. Uh, light, blue, light blue cubes are the simulated frog skin, and you'll notice the red green voxels are my, meant to approximate myocardiac tissue. Um, we asked Doug what he thought would happen if myocardiac tissue taken from early frog was rearranged into some shape and distribution other than adult frog heart or the different, uh, or the, or the different shapes that lead up to an adult frog heart. Would those patches of tissue communicate and synchronize? And Doug's answer was, I have no idea. So we made a conservative estimate that we built into the biophysics of the simulator, which is to assume that regardless of how the evolutionary algorithm puts together these red-green voxels, that they will not synchronize. 
Uh, you can see that there, uh, if you look carefully, you'll notice that the red and green are increasing and decreasing in volume a little bit, but they're doing this with random phase offsets relative to one another. So we're making this a particularly difficult design task for the evolutionary algorithm. It's going to have to design or evolve uh, one of these simulated bots to do something reliably using unreliable parts, parts that do not synchronize. This is a very, very difficult task for a human engineer to achieve. Uh, we ran this for a couple of weeks on our supercomputer here in Vermont. Um, this is a pretty computationally intensive uh, a simulator takes quite a way, quite a while to evaluate different solutions, but eventually uh, the evolutionary algorithm came up with this particular solution. Um, lots of interesting things about this particular solution. You'll notice that the evolutionary algorithm has placed mostly myocardiac tissue on the ventral or the bottom surface of this little bot, and it's put uh, the passive soft material, the simulated frog skin on the dorsal su surface, the top half, and it's got these small little appendages at the back that seem to push. Um, we evolved these bots to do something very simple, which is to try and move in a straight line as quickly as possible from the left to the right side of the bottom of the simulated Petri dish. And you can see that indeed this is what this bot is doing. If you look if you look carefully and hopefully the frame rate is good enough for you all to see that here, you'll notice that the random impulse forces that are being generated by the um, unsynchronized myocardiac tissue is sort of flowing up into the upper half of the robot. And that mass of soft and passive tissue is kind of absorbing and somehow averaging and directing uh, the sum of those forces in some way that produces relatively reliable forward uh, travel. I would argue that um, you could view this as a form of morphological computation. The, pass the passive material is somehow summing, averaging, uh, evening out the randomness of the desynchronized tissue. We haven't done any formal analysis of these kinds of solutions yet. I know this is something that uh, Helmut's group is very well known for. This could be a fun point of collaboration. Okay, so uh, that's step one of the projects. Step two is the sim to real problem, trying to transfer what we evolved in simulation to reality. Um, it's a relatively, a relatively uh, involved process. What you're looking at here, we're looking down uh, the, through the microscope with Doug Blackest and the microsurgeon. This is partway through the assembly, uh, the, uh, uh, the building process. At this point, Doug has isolated or dissociated frog skin cells from blastula. You can see these individual cells. Um, these cells don't like to be on their own. Um, they seem to be sort of acting to try and re-cohere into a multicellular assembly. Uh, my biology colleague, Mike Levin, refers to this as rebooting multicellularity. Um, this is sort of an extreme form of the frog I showed you before with the eye uh, on its butt that there's something here, there's some, we, we're tapping into this latent potential of living systems that they want to try and recover. They want to homeostat, they're ultra stable. When they're pushed outside of their comfort zone, they're doing something to try and recover in some way. So when we're building robots out of living tissues, the, the components themselves are kind of helping or, or maybe working against us. They're obviously active materials. They're not gonna do exactly what we say. Uh, at this point, I've, I'm skipping ahead in the assembly process or the manufacturing process. This is towards the end. Um, Doug, at this point, has this mass of frog cells flipped on its back, and he's reaching in with micro forceps and uh, subtractively re removing some of the unwanted material. This is him actually building a sculpture, he's a frog sculpture. He's not strictly building, he's not building the evolved solution that I showed you before, but this kind of just shows you the, the process. The xenobots themselves are a millimeter in diameter, um, so this is an extremely challenging task in and of itself. Imagine trying to sculpt a 3D shape into a poppy seed. That's basically what you're looking at here. Uh, I wouldn't be telling you about this project if we weren't successful in crossing the sim to real gap. It took us a fair bit of work to make this happen, but here's uh, a, a successful attempt. Uh, you can see the manufactured bot in the bottom. 
Uh, and although it doesn't quite have exactly the same 3D shape, it doesn't move in exactly the same way as uh, the evolved solution in silico, it's uh, close enough. We show that this is better than chance. Uh, it's not just a result of the spontaneous action of myocardiac tissue. We've retained some of this evolved form and function into the physical bot uh, in this case. OK, uh, we've uh, published three papers about the Xenobots uh, so far. What I just showed you was the first publication basically showing you proof of uh, basically demonstrating proof of principle that this is possible. Um, the team has carried on. We had a second publication that showed you could uh, create swimming Xenobots and you could do some slightly more complicated behaviors like go, see, remember, come back and tell. And this past December, we published our, our third paper in the series, uh, which was a somewhat surprising result to all of us on the team, which is that you can get these xenobots to self-replicate, but they replicate in a way very differently than frogs do, or in fact, the way that any uh, plant or animal does in nature. This is kinematic self-replication. It turns out that if you take a xenobot that you see in the center of the screen and you sprinkle dissociated frog skin cells into the dish, depending on the 3D geometry of that uh, xenobot, it will move about in the dish and it will end up pushing these dissociated cells into piles, not that differently from the way that a, a, a Roomba uh, robot, traditional robot does so. So there's not that much that's sophisticated in terms of sensory motor coordination in terms of the xenobot. So a side effect of this motion is it pushes these cells together. Um, these dissociated frog skin cells are adhesive. They're kind of sticky, so they stick together and tend to clump up into piles like you see here. Turns out that if a pile has a critical mass, if there's enough cells in that pile uh, over about 24 hours uh, or a few days, those piles will start to, to grow cilia. These are very, very small hairs on the surface of these piles. These cilia tend to synchronize and beat against the surrounding uh, freshwater fluid here. And some of these piles will start to move on their own. And given a fresh infusion of dissociated frog skin cells, those piles will push cells into piles that become motile pi piles and so on. And you get uh, you get parent xenobots producing or building child xenobots, which build grandchild xenobots, and off you go. So this is kinematic self-replication. It's a biobot version of something that John von Neumann dreamed up in the uh, 1960s, this idea of machines building copies of machines, building copies of machines. In von Neumann's day, and, and still very much to this day, the idea of von Neumann machines was that we were going to realize this with traditional materials like steel and ceramics and electronics and sensors and motors. Turns out that you can do this relatively easily with biobots as well. Okay, um, I wanted to talk about one last project and then I'd very much like to open this up to questions and discussion. Um, and this is a, a very recent project we just published on this uh, this past summer. Um, this is work by my PhD student, Atusa Parsa. Um, and I think this really touches on, uh, again, what Helmut mentioned, which is the future for morphological computation. I would say that the early years of morphological computation, we were trying to understand what morphological computation is, come up with good definitions, try to understand how exactly this transfer of computation from a control policy into the body of a robot should happen. One one interesting direction I think that our field can take in the years to come is not just to think about traditional computation being embodied in physical or mechanical materials or metamaterials or exotic materials, but how can these materials do perform computation in a way that's difficult or impossible for traditional electronics to do so? Are there completely new forms of computation that we might not have thought of? but that evolution, either natural evolution or artificial evolution, can discover. And I want to show you what I would argue is, uh, is a new form of computation that's difficult or impossible to do in traditional electronics. Um, you're, you're looking at it, and let me explain what you're looking at. This is a metamaterial. Uh, a metamaterial is, a is an umbrella term for a very broad class of materials that have non-traditional bulk properties. 
Just to give you an example, if you take a traditional soft material and you compress it from above and below, it will balloon out to the sides because it's trying to preserve volume. There are metamaterials where if you push from above and below, it will actually narrow uh, along the horizontal axis. That's a non uh, un unintuitive bulk property. You can create metamaterials out of lots of different kinds of materials. Um, what you're looking at here, this is a granular metamaterial. It's a metamaterial made from a whole bunch of circular grains. Um, if you look carefully at this video, you'll notice that it's periodic around the horizontal boundary. So you can think of this uh, sheet here as being wrapped around and touching on the far side. We have a collection of stiff and soft uh, particles. In this case, the light gray uh, particles are soft. The dark gray particles are rigid, and we are agitating this material in a very specific way. We have chosen two particles, the green and the blue particles, to be input particles, and we can choose to vibrate or supply uh, vibrational force or vibrational energy to one, both, or neither of these two input particles. In this video, you can see that we are uh, agitating the green input particle and not the blue particle. And we can then observe some other particle in the system. In this case, we've chosen the red particle. And we can look to, uh, we can see what is the relationship between the input vibrations and the resulting vibration, if any, at the output, uh, at the output port. In this case, you'll notice there's a little bit of vibration among at the red particle, but it's much less than the agitation of the green particle. There is a lot of damping going on in the system between the green and the red particle. Why does that matter? If you view these vibrations as binary inputs and outputs, you can view this as supplying one and zero at to the two input ports and receiving something that's close to zero at the output port. Which led us when we saw it when we started working on this with our uh, metamaterials colleagues, Rebecca Kramer Botiglio uh, at Yale and Corey O'Hearn also at Yale and Mark Shattuck at the City University of New York. It led uh, Atus and I to ask the question could you actually design these metamaterials? Uh, to compute, could you get them to act as logic gates? And the answer turns out to be yes. Uh, what I just showed you was one of the four cases of that particular material acting as an AND gate. We can vibrate neither one or both of the input ports, and we can try and design the material so that in the first three cases, that input energy is extinguished so that the output port does not vibrate, and only in the fourth case do we uh, extract any vibrational energy uh, at the output port. Uh, Atusa created an evolutionary algorithm that was searching over the mat uh, material space, the space of all possible metamaterials, given this particular uh, substrate, which is this granular metamaterial. The evolutionary algorithm in this case is choosing whether or not to uh, to create a particular stiff or soft particle. So basically how to combine soft and stiff particles. And the fitness function would look to see how little vibration there was in the first three cases and how much vibration there was in the fourth case. So you can boil that down to a fitness function that selects for metamaterials that exhibit increasing amounts of andness at a given frequency. Once she was able to accomplish that, she expanded her evolutionary algorithm into a multi-objective optimization method. Um, in a multi-objective optimization method, you're taking each potential solution, in our case, a metamaterial, and you're assigning two numbers to it, in this case, how well it acts as an AND gate at a low frequency. And then if we supply an additional four cases at a higher frequency, does it act as a different logical gate at that higher frequency. The second gate we chose was exclusive or. Turns out you can do that. So if you do this, if you evolve this system, what you get is uh, a set of solutions here shown in blue where you get specialists. You get one material like the one that I just showed you that is really good at acting as an AND gate at the low frequency, but does a very poor job of acting as an exclusive or gate at the high frequency frequency. You get the evolution of the op, uh, of another specialist, which is very good at acting as an uh, exclusive OR gate and terribly as acting at an AND gate. 
What was really surprising about this work and that we didn't think of when we were going into this project is you get um, a knee in the Pareto front. You get uh, solutions here that kind of pop out to the upper right, which means evolution is able to, dis to discover some metamaterials that do a pretty good job, not perfectly, but they do a pretty good job of acting as both, uh, acting as both gates at different frequencies. At low frequencies, this particular material here is good at acting as and. At high frequency, it's pretty good at acting as exclusive or. I asked Atusa, what happens if you supply the four cases at the same time? So she did that by superposing the frequencies. And so what you're looking at in this left column here is we supply these four cases. And from the perspective of the meta material, it's receiving zeros and ones at low and high frequency simultaneously. We can then do, we can then observe the red particle. We can do a Fourier transform and look at the power uh, of the vibration at those two frequencies at this output particle. And it turns out that if you squint and you look at this right hand column, if you focus on the low frequencies, you can see the low frequency only shows up in the fourth case. So the red particle is acting as an AND gate at the low frequency. And at the same time, at a different point in the frequency spectrum, it's acting as exclusive or. So in essence, what we've managed to evolve is a meta material that is doing something. We don't have a good name for it yet. Uh, Polycomputing is sort of the name we have for this phenomenon at the moment. It's able to compute the results of two different computations at the same place at the same time, the red particle, without recourse to quantum mechanics here. Uh, it just doing it at different places in the frequency space. This is something that perhaps you could do with traditional electronics. I'm not an electronic, I'm not an electrical engineer or a physicist. Maybe there's a way to do this, but this is, I would argue, a pretty exotic form of computation that this physical material clearly is pretty good at. So I'm just going to finish up here. Um, and thank uh, members of my lab, um, Atusa and David Matthews and Sam Kriegman all contributed to the work that I showed you today. And thanks to our funding sponsors. And hopefully we have a few mo uh, minutes for questions. Thanks very much.